Part 2. Anatomy of a Manhunt. Chapter 10. An hour later Claude Level emerged from the conference room dazed and bewildered. For 50 minutes he had listened as the Minister of the Interior had briefed him on the task that lay ahead. On entering the room he had been bidden to sit at the end of the table, sandwiched between the head of the CRS and his own chief, Bouvier. In silence from the other 14 men he had read the Roland report, while aware that curious eyes were assessing him from all sides. When he put the report down the worry had started inside him. Why call him? Then the minister started to speak. It was neither a consultation nor a request. It was a directive, followed by a copious briefing. He would set up his own office, he would have unlimited access to all necessary information, the entire resource of the organizations headed by the men seated round the table would be at his disposal. There were to be no limits to the costs incurred. Several times the need for absolute secrecy, the imperative of the head of state himself, had been impressed on him. While he listened his heart sank. They were asking, no, demanding, the impossible. He had nothing to go on. There was no crime, yet. There were no clues. There were no witnesses, except three whom he could not talk to. Just a name, a code name, and the whole world to search in. Claude Level was, as he knew, a good cop. He had always been a good cop. Slow, precise, methodical, painstaking. Just occasionally he had shown the flash of inspiration that is needed to turn a good cop into a remarkable detective. But, he had never lost sight of the fact that in police work 99% of the effort is routine, unspectacular inquiry, checking and double checking. Laboriously building up a web of parts until the parts become a whole, the whole becomes a net, and the net finally encloses the criminal with a case that will not just make headlines but stand up in court. He was known in the PJ as a bit of a plotter, a methodical man who hated publicity and had never given the sort of press conferences on which some of his colleagues had built their reputations. And yet he had gone steadily up the ladder, solving his cases, seeing his criminals convicted. When a vacancy had occurred at the head of the homicide division of the Brigade Crimiel 3, Years ago, even the others in line for the job had agreed it was fair that level should have got the job. He had a good steady record with homicide and in three years had never failed to procure an arrest, although once the accused was acquitted on a technicality. As head of homicide he had come more closely to the notice of Maurice Bouvier, chief of the whole brigade, and another old-style cop. So when Dupuy had died suddenly a few weeks back it was Bouvier who had asked that level become his new deputy. There were some in the PJ who suspected that Bouvier bogged down for a lot of the time with administrative details, appreciated a retiring subordinate who could handle the big headline making cases quietly without stealing his superior's thunder. But perhaps they were just being uncharitable. After the meeting at the ministry the copies of the Roland report were gathered up for storage in the minister's safe. Level alone was allowed to keep Bouvier's copy. His only request had been that he be allowed to seek the cooperation in confidence of the heads of some of the criminal investigation. Forces of the major countries likely to have the identity of a professional assassin like the jackal on their files. Without such cooperation, he pointed out, it would be impossible even to start looking. Sanguinetti had asked if such men could be relied on to keep their mouths shut. Level had replied that he knew personally the men he needed to contact, that his inquiries would not be official but would be along the personal contact basis that exists between most of the Western world's top policemen. After some reflection the minister had granted the request. And now he stood in the hall waiting for Bouvier, and watching the chiefs of department file past him on their way out. Some nodded curtly and passed on. 
Others ventured a sympathetic smile as they said good night. Almost the last two. Leave, while inside the conference room Bouvier conferred quietly with Max. Fernet, was the aristocratic colonel from the Elysee staff. Level had briefly. Caught his name, as the men round the table were introduced, as Saint Clair de. Villa Eubin. He stopped in front of the small and roly-poly commissaire and eyed. Him with ill-concealed distaste. I hope, commissaire, that you will be successful in your inquiries, and rapidly. So, he said. We at the palace will be keeping a very close eye on your progress. In the event that you should fail to find this bandit, I can assure you that there will be repercussions. He turned on his heel and stalked down the stairs towards the foyer. Level said. Nothing but blinked rapidly several times. One of the factors in the makeup of Claude Level that had led to his success. When inquiring into crime over the previous 20 years since he had joined. The police force of the Fourth Republic as a young detective in Normardy was. His capacity to inspire people with the confidence to talk to him. He lacked the imposing bulk of Bouvier, the traditional image of the authority. Of the law. Nor did he have the smartness with words that exemplified so many. Of the new breed of young detectives now coming into the force, who could. Bully and browbeat a witness into tears. He did not feel the lack. He was aware that most crime in any society is either carried out against, or. Witnessed by, the little people the shopkeeper, the sales assistant, the postman or the bank clerk. These people he could make talk to him, and he knew it. It was partly because of his size, he was small, and resembled in many ways. The cartoonist's image of a henpecked husband, which, although no one in the department knew it, was just what he was. His dress was dowdy, a crumpled suit and a Macintosh. His manner was mild, almost apologetic, and in his request of a witness for information it contrasted so sharply with the attitude the witness had experienced from his first interview with the law, that the witness tended to warm towards the detective as to a refuge from the roughness of the subordinates. But there was something more. He had been head of the homicide division of the most powerful criminal police force in Europe, he had been ten years a detective with the Brigade Criminelle of the renowned police judiciaire of France. Behind the mildness and the seeming simplicity was a combination of shrewd brain and a dogged refusal to be ruffled or intimidated by anyone when he was carrying out a job. He had been threatened by some of the most vicious gang bosses of France, who had thought from the rapid blinking with which Level greeted such approaches that their warnings had been duly taken. Only. Later, from a prison cell, had they had the leisure to realize they had. Underestimated the soft brown eyes and the toothbrush mustache. Twice he had been subjected to intimidation by wealthy and powerful figures. Once when an industrialist had wished to see one of his junior employees. Charged with embezzlement on the basis of a cursory glance at the auditors evidence, and once when a society blade had wished investigations into the death by drugs of a young actress to be dropped. In the first case the inquiry into the affairs of the industrialist had resulted in certain other and far bigger discrepancies being unearthed which had nothing to do with the junior accountant, but which had caused the industrialist to wish he had departed for Switzerland while he had the chance. The second time the Society host had ended up with a lengthy period as a guest of the state in which to regret he had ever bothered to head a vice ring from his avenue Victor Hugo. Penthouse. Claude Level's reaction to the remarks of Colonel St. Clair was to blink like a rebuke schoolboy and say nothing. But it did not subsequently in any way affect his conduct of the job with which he had been saddled. As the last man filed out of the conference room, Maurice Bouvier joined him. Max Fernet wished him luck, shook hands briefly and headed down the stairs. Bouvier clapped a ham-like hand on Level's shoulder. Eh, bien, 
Mon Petit Claude. So that's the way it is, Hein. All right, it was me. Who suggested the PJ handle this business? It was the only thing to do. Those. Others would have talked round in circles forever. Come, we'll talk in the car. He led the way downstairs and the pair of them climbed into the back of the Citroen that waited in the courtyard. It was past nine o'clock and a dark purple wheel lying over New Illy was all that remained of the day. Bouvier's car swept down the Avenue de Marigny and over the place Clemenceau. Level glanced out to the right and up the brilliant river of the Champs-Élysées, whose grandeur on a summer night never ceased to surprise and excite him, despite the ten years that had passed since he came up from the provinces. Bouvier spoke at last. You'll have to drop whatever you are doing. Everything. Clear the desk. Completely. I'll assign Fabier and Malcost to take over your outstanding cases. Do you want a new office for this job? No, I prefer to stick to my present one. Okay, fine, but from now on it becomes headquarters of Operation Find the Jackal. Nothing else. Right. Is there anyone you want to help you? Yes. Karen, said Level, referring to one of the younger inspectors who had worked with him in homicide and whom he had brought to his new job as assistant chief of the brigade criminal. Okay, you have Karen. Anyone else? No thank you. But Karen will have to know. Bouvier thought for a few moments. It should be all right. They can't expect miracles. Obviously you must have an assistant. But don't tell him for an hour or two. I'll ring Frey when I get to the office and ask for formal clearance. Nobody else has to know, though. It would be in the press inside two days if it got out. Nobody else, just Karen, said Level. Bone. There's one last thing. Before I left the meeting Sanguinetti suggested the whole group who were there tonight be kept informed at regular intervals of progress and developments. Frey agreed. Fernet and I tried to head it off, but we lost. There's to be a briefing by you every evening at the ministry from now on. Ten o'clock sharp. Oh, God, said Level. In theory, continued Bouvier with heavy irony, we shall all be available to offer our best advice and suggestions. Don't worry, Claude, Fernet and I will be there too, in case the wolves start snapping. This is until further notice, asked Level. Afraid so. The bugger of it is, there's no time schedule for this operation. You've just got to find this assassin before he gets to Big Charles. We don't know whether the man himself has a timetable, or what it could be. It might be for a hit. Tomorrow morning, maybe not for a month yet. You have to assume you are working flat out until he has been caught, or at least identified and located. From then on I think the action service boys can take care of things. Bunch of thugs, murmured Level. Granted, said Bouvier easily, but they have their uses. We live in hair-raising times, my dear Claude. Added to a vast increase in normal crime, we now have political crime. There are some things that just have to be done. They do them. Anyway, just try and find this blighter, huh? The car swept into the Cata or Fevres and turned through the gates of the PJ. Ten minutes later Claude Level was back in his office. He walked to the window, opened it and leaned out, gazing across the river towards the Cata. Grands Augustins on the left bank in front of him. Although separated by a narrow strip of the Seine where it flowed round the Isle de la Site, he was close. Enough to see the diners in the pavement restaurants dotted along the quay and hear the laughter and the clink of bottles on glasses of wine. Had he been a different kind of man it might have occurred to him to realize 
that the powers conferred on him in the last 90 minutes had made him, for a spell at least, the most powerful cop in Europe, that nobody short of the president or the interior minister could veto his request for facilities, that he could almost mobilize the army, provided it could be done secretly. It might also have occurred to him that exalted though his powers were they were dependent upon success, that with success he could crown his career with honors, but that in failure he could be broken as St. Clair de Villa Eubin had obliquely indicated. But because he was what he was, he thought of none of these things. He was puzzling as to how he would explain over the phone to Amelie that he was not coming home until further notice. There was a knock on the door. Inspectors Malcost and Favier came in to collect the dossiers of the four cases. On which level had been working when he had been called away earlier that evening. He spent half an hour briefing Malcost on the two cases he was assigning to him, and Favier on the other two. When they had gone he sighed heavily. There was a knock on the door. It was Lucy and Karen. I just got a call from Commissaire Bouvier's office, he began. He told me to report to you. Quite right. Until further notice I have been taken off all routine duties and given a rather special job. You've been assigned to be my assistant. He did not bother to flatter Karen by revealing that he had asked for the young inspector to be his right-hand man. The desk phone rang, he picked it up and listened briefly. Right, he resumed, that was Bouvier to say you have been given security clearance to be told what it is all about. For a start you had better read this. While Karen sat on the chair in front of the desk and read the Roland file. Level cleared all the remaining folders and notes off his desk and stacked them. On the untidy shelves behind him. The office hardly looked like the nerve center. Of the biggest manhunt in France. Police offices never do look much. Levels. Was no exception. It was no more than 12 feet by 14, with two windows on the south. Face looking out over the river towards the lively honeycomb of the Latin. Quarter clustering round the boulevard Saint Michel. Through one of the windows. The sounds of the night and the warm summer air drifted in. The office contained. Two desks, one for level, which stood with its back to the window, another for a. Secretary which stood along the east wall. The door was opposite the window. Apart from the two desks and two chairs behind them, there was one other. Upright chair, an armchair next to the door, six large grey filing cabinets standing. Along almost the whole of the west wall and whose combined tops supported an array of reference and law books, and one set of bookshelves situated between the windows and stuffed with almanacs and files. Of signs of home there was only the framed photograph on Level's desk of an ample and determined looking lady who was Madame Amelie Level, and two children, a plain girl with steel rimmed glasses and pigtails, and a youth with an expression as mild and put upon as his father. Karen finished reading and looked up. Maird, he said. As you say, an enormi Maird, replied Level, who seldom permitted himself. The use of strong language. Most of the top commissaires of the PJ were known to their immediate staff by nicknames like L.E. Patron or L.E. View, but Claude Level, perhaps because he never drank more than a small aperitif, did not smoke or swear, and reminded younger detectives inevitably of one of their former school teachers, was known within homicide and more lately in the corridors of the brigade chief's administrative floor as L.E. Prof. Sewer. Had he not been such a good thief-taker, he would have become something of a figure of fun. Nevertheless, continued Level, listen while I fill you in on the details. It will be the last occasion I shall have time. For thirty minutes he briefed Karen on the events of the afternoon, from Roger. Frey's meeting with the president to the meeting in the ministry conference room, 
to his own brusque summons on the recommendation of Maurice Bouvier. To the final setting up of the office in which they now sat as the headquarters of the manhunt for the jackal. Karen listened in silence. Blimey, he said at last when Level had finished, they have lumbered you. He thought for a moment, then looked up at his chief with worry and concern. Mon. Commissaire, you know they have given you this because no one else wants it? You know what they will do to you if you fail to catch this man in time. Level nodded with a tinge of sadness. Yes, Lucien, I know. There's nothing I can do. I've been given the job. So from. Now we just have to do it. But where on earth do we start? We start by recognizing that we have the widest powers ever granted to two. Cops in France, replied Level cheerfully, so, we use them. To start with, get installed behind that desk. Take a pad and note the following. Get my normal secretary transferred or given paid leave until further notice. No. One else can be let into the secret. You become my assistant and secretary rolled. Into one. Get a camp bed in here from emergency stores, linen, and pillows. Washing and shaving tackle. Get a percolator of coffee, some milk, and sugar. Brought from the canteen and installed. We're going to need a lot of coffee. Get onto the switchboard and instruct them to leave 10 outside lines and one. Operator permanently at the disposal of this office. If they quibble, refer them to. Bouvier personally. As for any other requests from me for facilities, get straight. Onto the department chief and quote my name. Fortunately this office now gets. Top priority from every other ancillary service, by order. Prepare a circular. Memorandum, copy to every department chief who attended this evening's meeting, ready for my signature, announcing that you are now my sole assistant, and empowered to require from them anything that I would ask them for, personally if I were not engaged. Got it? Karen finished writing and looked up. Got it, chief. I can do that throughout the night. Which is the top priority? the telephone switchboard. I want a good man on that, the best they've got. Get on to chief of admin at his home, and again quote Bouvier for authority. Right. What do we want from them first? I want, as soon as they can get it, a direct link personally to the head of the homicide division of the criminal police of seven countries. Fortunately, I know. Most of them personally from past meetings of Interpol. In some cases I know. The deputy chief. If you can't get one, get the other. The countries are, United States, that means the Office of Domestic. Intelligence in Washington. Britain, Assistant Commissioner, Crime, Scotland. Yard. Belgium. Holland. Italy. West Germany. South Africa. Get them at home. Or in the office. When you get each of them one by one, arrange a series of telephone calls. From Interpol communications room between me and them between 7 and 10 in the morning at 20 minute intervals. Get onto Interpol. Communications and book the calls as each homicide chief at the other end. Agrees to be in his own communications room at the appointed time. The calls should be person to person on the UHF frequency and there is to be no listening. In. Impress on each of them that what I have to say is for their ears only and of top priority not only for France but possibly for their own country. Prepare me a list by six in the morning of the schedule of the seven calls that have been booked in order of sequence. In the meantime, I am going down to homicide to see if a foreign killer has ever been suspected of operating in France and not been picked up. I confess. Nothing in that line comes to mind, and in any case I suspect Rodin would have been more careful in his selection than that. Now, do you know what to do? Karen, looking slightly dazed, glanced up from his several pages of scribbled 
notes. Yes, chief, I've got it. Bone, I'd better get to work. He reached out for the telephone. Claude Level passed out of the office and headed for the stairs. As he did so, the clock of Notre Dame further down the island chimed midnight, and the world passed into the morning of August 12th.